What I have to offer is very simple. It has nothing to do with acquiring any special power or powers. It has nothing to do with acquiring a, a state of mind. It has nothing to do with any qualities really at all not even the warm, fuzzy, gentle qualities. It has nothing to do with that. That's not what I'm speaking about. It's not what my teacher asked me to speak to you about. It's not what his teacher spoke to him about. It's really about what is eternally, undeniably, uncontrollably, permanently here in every moment, every second, in every situation, in every state of mind. And recognizing what is permanently here is ungraspable by the mind because it is not an object. Everything that is graspable by the mind, even the most sublime and elevated states, have a birth and an existence and a death. There was a time when it or they weren't, a time when it or they are, and a time when it or they are gone. And if you will look in your life or in even a day of your life, you will recognize this is true of all thoughts, all emotions, all people, all conclusions, all self-definitions, all definitions of others, they're constantly being born, existing for a while, and then changing and dying. I cannot emphasize this enough. This is perhaps the biggest leap for the mind to grasp <laughs> that everything that can be grasped by the mind is subject to birth and death. And in that recognition there is a, an opening where for an instant there is a non-mental knowing the permanence of oneself. Not one's body, not one's thoughts, not one's emotions, not one's accomplishments, not one's spiritual powers, not one's worldly powers, not one's elevated states, not one's lowered states, none of that. Because they all are subject to birth and death. So I'm not speaking to who you think you are. That has no capacity to realize the truth of who you are. It's too big. Who you think you are is a, an appearance and a disappearance in the truth of who you are. But since you are who you are, not who you think you are, you can recognize this. It is your right, your birthright, 
to recognize this. It is nothing that anyone can give you and it is nothing that can ever be taken away from you. It can be veiled by the powers of mind. But a veil does not really cover. You, you see a veil and you see or you sense or you intuit something behind the veil. It is you. And the veiling is simply your thoughts of who you are. Your latest self-definitions, especially the enlightened self-definitions. They are the gossamer veils, but they are deadly. They're perhaps the biggest trap of all because of the promise of being rocked back to sleep. So this message from my teacher and his teacher is unsentimental, although it allows all sentimentality. It is ruthless, absolutely ruthless, although it allows gentleness. It slays you, it kills you. And in that, you are revealed as eternal life. But you don't get anything from it. You don't get the riches that you have thought would give you happiness or the women or the men or the job. You may lose all that. <laughs> you may. The willingness to lose it all is required. The willingness to lose everything. Because in the willingness to lose everything there is also, the loss of the last bit of self-definition. And when this is lost, you are unveiled radiantly, as you always are. I'm trying to grasp what you're saying. Don't. That's it. Okay. That's the point. Ah, now, you see, it's already made it easier. Don't grasp what I'm saying. The mind will attempt to, and you recognize that. That's excellent. And you tell the truth about that. That's one of the reasons you're up here. Then you see it's possible to recognize that grasping, to recognize the impulse to grasp, and to recognize what's under the impulse to grasp. So what fuels this grasping impulse? Is there an emotion or a thought or a belief that gives rise to this need to grasp or this attempt to grasp? Well, I think I'm here to try to find some truth or try to find a way to... Uh, what I'm here for was seeking inspiration. Okay. I know nothing about you, I, mm -hmm. actually. And I don't know what's underneath that, except that I am... That I live in my mind. Okay. I, I admit that. Great. So then this is an opportunity to see what maybe is deeper or closer than your mind. So if for a moment what you are trying to grasp you recognize you will never grasp. Does that evoke any emotion? What if certain failure is guaranteed in this grasping category? Is there any emotion that's evoked in your gut? Probably a feeling of surrender. Oh, really? Yeah. Probably? Yeah. Like theoretically? I'm still in or, my mind. Yeah, so in, my mind. in order to really answer this question, you have to drop out of your mind and just let your mind drop into your body and see if there's anything agitated in there or, or anything that uh, 
feeds the staying in the safety of uh, theoretical discussion. I have to confess that I live in my mind, and it drives me crazy when therapists and people tell me to draw into my body. Okay, well, I'm here to drive you crazier so, than you have ever been okay, driven. I'll try. <laughs> okay, I'll try. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm working on it. Yeah. <laughs> because you don't just live in your mind. It's impossible. It's impossible. I understood what you said when what you are here to invite us to is, is um, not something that is able to be expressed in words. Mm -hmm, beautiful. I understood that. Yes. And that understanding is deeper than your mind. Because that's, in that understanding there's a resolution of paradox and opposites. And, and that's more than the mind can handle. So maybe what you're calling the mind is actually more inclusive of the depths of being. Mm -hmm. So then it's maybe it's like the Buddhist mind, big mind, which includes every phenomena, every appearance, every disappearance, every thought, every emotion. Then there's no problem with mind. But this mind still lives in you. You don't live in it. Mm -hmm. You understand that? Yeah. Oh, great. I think my next, the next thing I was thinking was, well, then what is the connection between the mind and the heart? And when you say dropping into the body, what about the heart? And oh, what's your experience? My experience is that it's a challenge for me to drop into my heart and that I work on that. Mm -hmm. and, as, and what fuels the challenge? What makes it a challenge? That's really what I want to get at. Shall I tell you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Since you've worked no. on it so oh, hard. Okay. Yeah. Fear. Fear. That's the only reason to grasp anything. That's the only reason to understand anything. There's nothing wrong with fear. Fear has a very natural role to play. It's, it's in our structure as human beings, and it's very useful. Without it, we don't survive. Mm -hmm. It's intelligent to have fear. But at a certain point, when you make a statement, I live in my mind, and I find it hard to experience or drop into my heart, then fear is like grown out of proportion to its usefulness. Mm -hmm. So there's huge unexamined fear, fear of not being, fear of not existing, fear of dying. Does that ring true to you? Not. A Okay, I'm trying not to think about it. Yeah. Okay. That's why I said ring okay. yes. true to you. Yes. Yes. Really? Good. Yes. Excellent. Because it's, yeah, I could be wrong. I'm not saying I'm, but in general, that's true. In general, when one uh, lives in thought, it's an avoidance of something that is big and uncontrollable. It's called life or self, or truth, or death. So how do you get there? Uh, well, you don't get there. But that very question, I can appreciate it, and it's natural and it's appropriate. It's already here. Okay. It's like saying, how do I get to life? Life is already here. You're in life, or life is in you, or both. So you don't have to do anything to get there. What is useful is to see how you are avoiding being where you are. And you've already seen that. You, you came up here saying that about your thoughts and your, your intellect. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with thoughts, nothing wrong with intellect, both exquisite powers. But regarding reality or the continuum of being, in this meeting at least, useless. So you can never grasp who you are. 
because to grasp it, you would have to be separate from it as a subject grasping an object. But you can be who you are, not who you think you are. Closer than that. I know it may appear that there's always one thought following another and some deep, profound, complex thoughts. Mm-hmm. But many times in a day, there's a space where there's no thought. Because of our conditioning, we dismiss that space or ignore it or even deny it and just jump to the next thought because it's the thought that has value in our lives. Because thoughts can be supreme and human beings have developed thought to a very high degree and it's wondrous. So please understand, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But it's limited and actually our thoughts themselves are limited when we don't recognize that space that remains unthought, that, that actually the thoughts appear in. I'd like to recognize that. I'd like a break. You, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's, a lot that's of very good. Chatter up That's here. excellent. That's telling the truth. I don't think I have breaks. I understand <laughs> you don't think you have. But just in sitting up here just for a moment, there was a break. You think, oh, really? If I, if I read the signs correctly, there was a moment where there was some space. Just very simple. You don't recognize it because there's nothing happening in it. It's not a, there's not a feeling. There's not a, an event. There's not a, a thought. It's just space. And that's when I am who I truly am? You always are who you truly are. No thought can separate you from who you are except as you believe the thought to be who you are. Mm -hmm. So that's what's called veiling or the illusion. But you are always this spaciousness, beingness, in which this human being has appeared with all the human mechanisms of fear and intellect and cause and effect, an exquisite display of intelligence but the space, the source of that. This is what the invitation is, is to recognize that. Not to give you that, but it's already present. It's never been absent. But in the attention to the thoughts, in the hope that if I can just think the right thought or just grasp with the thought process, that which will give me eternal peace or true love or real freedom, when, when that hope is in play, eternal peace and true love and real freedom go overlooked. Simply go overlooked. Tragically go overlooked. Sometimes comically go overlooked. Well, now I hear you saying that peace and freedom and love are motivations for Mm. Often, yeah. For for most activity. For un well, for understanding who we truly are. Or for anything else. You see, once you can reach a point where you can say peace and freedom and love, or, or why I want to know who I am, then you've already become disillusioned to some degree with hoping the right job or the right lover or the right body or the right state of health or the right bank account will give you peace and freedom and love. Mm -hmm. It's essential. That's called maturity. I call it disillusionment because disillusionment has a, a, usually a negative connotation, but I think it's positive. It's essential to be very deeply, profoundly disillusioned with what you think will give you what you really want. I'm assuming in this case it has something to do with peace and love and freedom. Mm -hmm. That's, Those sound good. Yeah, they are. Mm -hmm. They are quite good. And of course we live with 
Well, even in the midst of imminent possible war, we live in peace, relatively speaking, if you look around the globe. And you know that there is love in your life, even if it's just the love you experience with an animal or a sunset or another person or a movie star or a book or a painting. And you know also that you have relative freedom in your life. We have freedom to be here, to assemble like this. You have the freedom to actually ask questions honestly. This is huge. And yet even that is not enough. It's huge. And I would wish everyone in the world to have that. But it's not enough. Because it still overlooks that which is at peace, in love, and free, regardless of the relative nature of things. And that's who you are. It's the space I was talking about. It doesn't disappear when thoughts appear. Just as because of our attention to thoughts as sources of great power, it goes overlooked. But it's here. It's always here. Thought is not the enemy. It's just in our culture, thought has become the god. And it's a false god. It's not the enemy. It's a great servant. And in recognizing God as a spaciousness of being, then you recognize love and peace and freedom as inherent to who you are. Inherent, meaning it's here always. And this is huge. If you aren't searching for understanding in some kind of mental way or mental formulation, words and sentences and paragraphs like we have been taught and like the human being is blessed to have the power to understand. But if you aren't trying to understand that way, rather just already knowing that you are, you're here, you are. Like, it's beyond understanding, right? You don't have to understand that. It's not required to understand it unless you want to get into some kind of mental gymnastic exercise of what does that mean I am, where am I, what is here, and start to break it down. If you don't go there, with your mind. You just rest in being here. Then what I have to say to you can be realized. And the truth is, it's already realized. And what I have to say to you points and confirms that. But I guarantee you, if you try to understand it in the way that we have maybe infinite capacity to understand, you'll misunderstand it. I guarantee you that. I didn't know that when I first started speaking to people. <laughs> but I guarantee that at this point. So then the challenge, of course, is to let your consciousness fall into simple beingness. Not a state of meditation even, or a state of samadhi, or a state of trance, or sleep. Just alert, awake, consciousness, being 
here, which it already is. So it takes no effort, takes no understanding. Then the invitation and the message from my teacher and the confirmation of what is free and at peace and in love and in truth who you are is recognized. There is exquisite mental understanding that can follow that recognition and usually does. But the danger is trying to lead with mental understanding. And I suspect that probably everybody, and if not everybody, almost everybody in this room has a great deal of understanding of spiritual matters. So I am inviting you to put that aside. Not that it's wrong. It's not right or wrong. But for our purposes, it's useless. Really, useless. <laughs> However exalted and exquisite and complex or simple or profound, for our purposes, the purpose of the transmission of what I have discovered and what you have discovered, of what the invitation is, of what the message is. Anything other than consciousness simply being is useless. It's a relief, isn't it? Yes. Then we can have conversations. We will have conversations that can engage mental understanding, but aren't founded in that, aren't grounded in mental understanding, not grounded anywhere. And from that, naturally, there then arises a direct experience for yourself of the truth of who you are. And that's really all I'm here for. That recognition of the truth of who you are and the, the role I play is encouragement of that recognition and confirmation of that recognition and challenging of that recognition and inquiring into the depths of that recognition and discovering with each other the limitlessness of that recognition through conversation, through sitting, through appearing to each other and through disappearing from each other. been saying and uh, sometimes I think I understand but I don't know what that means then that's right you don't understand and sometimes I think I don't understand and do you know what that means I, I don't know what that means either <laughs> <laughs> you are understanding that the meaning that you give about understanding and not understanding is just arbitrary based on some past understanding, right? I think that sounded pretty good. That's a pretty good wrap-up. Yeah, I... Yeah. That's excellent. That's excellent. It's shocking sometimes. 
and disconcerting because you have relied, as we have all been trained to rely, on our past knowledge or our past experiences to explain what is happening now. Yes, that's right. But that must be uh, shook up. It's, a, it's like a platform that's very shaky. So it's good. Maybe one of the legs is already off the platform. And there's some stability if you stay over in the corner, you know, three-legged platform. But I'm inviting you over to the side where there's no leg. So the whole platform can collapse. Do you understand that? <laughs> yes, no. you do. <laughs> oh, this is good, you see? It's like this. <laughs> oh, this is very beautiful. Right here. Right now. Don't try to understand anything. Just in this, just for a split second, just a beingness. You know, some embarrassment was on the periphery, but the platform collapsed. And there was just space. I guess you're right. <laughs> They're laughing because it evokes it in them, too. It's so joyous for this platform to collapse. That that which we think is our salvation is revealed to be our obstacle. And when we fall, off of this salvation that was obstacle, is obstacle, we fall into space. We have space falling into space. <laughs> See, pretty soon it's just a pointer, you don't even need it. <laughs> So then, I mean, what to do? Well, this is this is the, the question, that, well, what to do, you know. But just to recognize that that question is the impulse to rebuild a platform. So what to do is to trust space for what? A minute, some hours, this weekend. Just to trust that space, that spaciousness, and discover that doing appears and disappears in that quite naturally without any need of you to have the thought or follow the thought what to do. This is the radicalness of what can be understood. Radical means like at the root the platform cannot even be rebuilt. The wood is pulled up by the root. You see, I see you understand it is beautiful. That was beautiful. You are beautiful. Spaciousness is beautiful. Even the platform is beautiful. But that's been overemphasized to the degree that it has somehow appeared to be more important or more real than space. But that platform, it seems to be always, I mean, Maybe for a moment it's not there, but it's always being rebuilt. Yes, it, it is throughout time. I mean, that's the hardwiring of the organism. It is always being rebuilt. So the challenge is actually going against the whole thrust of your human nature. That's the adventure of it. The whole thrust of your animal nature. Then isn't that chasing after something? It's stopping the chase, because the building of the platform is so that you can be up high and right. knock them off, right? Okay. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but then, trying to stop the platform building... It, you don't have to try to stop the platform building, because if you do that, you're just building another platform over here mm -hmm. saying, Get back, you bad platform! Building a higher platform, a higher, holy platform. 
then I can really look down on you lowly platforms and get rid of you. No, no, it's not to try. To, it's simply to see that the mind's activity is to build these platforms, to find a place to abide, to land. My teacher's radical teaching that he asked me to bring to you is non-abidance in the mind anywhere. So the ramifications of this are this is the space that holds the space that holds the space that holds the space that holds the platform. So the mind mm -hmm. generates its activity, but you are the awareness of that activity. You are the spaciousness that that activity appears in. So the going up onto the platform, living on the platform, is the identification of yourself as something that needs this platform to exist. And that's not so. That's not so. We've been taught that, but it's not so. And the way that we can discover it directly, rather than just taking another teaching that says not so, the way that it can be discovered directly is to be the space, not needing a platform. Recognizing the impulse to build platforms, but recognizing what is closer than that, deeper than that, even more beautiful than the most beautiful platform. <coughs> Yes. <laughs> so when I say you are beautiful, when I feel this beauty, I am speaking to the spaciousness that already recognizes itself as that spaciousness. It already knows that. It's not to create space. It's self-recognition. It's not even to get rid of platforms. What's the matter with platforms? They'll rot in their own time. Nature takes care of that. Like this body will rot in its own time. But to recognize what is the truth of who you are. This is the beauty. This is self-recognition, eye to eye. <laughs> Did you know this at some time before you learned all the things you learned? Sometime as a small child, the baby is, at some point there was something just free and then all the building began there's nothing wrong with the building well there's a lot wrong with the building and there's a lot right with the building but what's closer than the right or the wrong the true beauty of who you are this is still here still free Thank you. You're very welcome. Truly. All people come to <clears throat> meetings of all kinds, but in particular spiritual meetings with some expectation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that expectation, of course, is built on some 
memory of a past experience, whether that's your actual past experience or something that's incorporated into your memory from some reading or some movie or hearing about it. Imagination, in other words. And so there's a certain tension built around that expectation, which is very different from an intention, which is also brought to spiritual meetings. An intention to be free, an intention to truly wake up, an intention to truly discover who one is, to truly realize the truth once and for all. This, uh, an intention, and that in itself is uh, no problem, and it actually is a great assistance. It's a pure desire. But unfortunately, it is always, let us say, no, it's not always, but just, again, just for the purpose of assuming it to be always, because that's very skillful, colored by expectation. So that the intention, uh, it, the desire, the, the pure desire to be free is then colored by it will feel like, it will look like, it will give me, it will result in, I will know because, based on the past. The purpose of this retreat is to realize your intention to be free. That's why we have gathered which is the same intention is to realize to be who you are, which is free. And all that stands in the way is your expectations, because that is, those are fabricated by mind based on past and future, changeable, mutable, rearrangeable and ultimately empty and unsatisfying. And most of you already know that they, your expectations are not satisfying. Although all of you have some hope <laughs> that maybe, maybe they will be, like a, an abusive relationship. Maybe this time, what appears as clean expectation will be clean, but that's not the nature of expectation. The nature of expectation is that it's a, a barrier, it's empty, it's illusion, but it's a barrier between you and your intention to realize who you are. It can get very complicated, as you know, because our lives are very complicated. Our past are very complicated, and then it's not just even our past, it's the whole collective history, not even just humans, but of animals, and then finally of, of the whole earth, of this whole solar system, of the universe. That's where the complication is. And the expectations, of course, play into the, the natural human desire for pleasure. And the deep, true memory of the wholeness of oneself, of the perfection of being that is still alive, but cloaked or covered or veiled with images of being something or somebody or somebody else being something or somebody that can give to you or take away from you what is rightfully yours. This is samsara, this conditioning, this ego. And the gurus of the East call it samsara. The gurus of the West call it ego. It's the same.
So then when we realize that to some degree, oh, it's the ego, oh, it's my expectations, oh, it's my thoughts, then because ego is so exquisite, because samsara is so infinite, there arises, well, I will get rid of my ego. And then I expect I'll be very happy. <laughs> and there arises whole schools and religions of self-hatred and self-denial and torture. Torture as a way to happiness. This is how, how twisted it all gets. And we know that within our own selves. So that when we uh, arrive at a retreat, say, and we are sitting together the first morning, and perhaps there's not an experience of oceanic bliss. And, <laughs> and there arises always, not really always, but assuming always a thought, well, I'm doing it wrong, or she's doing it wrong, or they're doing it wrong, or it can't be done, or whatever, some thought that is part of this uh, tradition of self-hatred and self-torture. All to get to the bliss of being. Yes, I'm calling your name. <laughs> <laughs> I know it well. <laughs> the true spiritual pointing or true spiritual understanding is the recognition that this search for the intention or search for this primordial bliss of being can never be fulfilled in expectations of return or acquisition. Can never be fulfilled in desires that someone give it to you or that you get it. This is a, a maturing or a disillusionment that must occur and will in time occur after over and over and over and over and over, lifetime after lifetime. Like, how many lifetimes have happened since you were two years old? So many lifetimes. So many lifetimes, always reaching, always getting, always losing. Oh, reaching again. Oh, different reach, different get, different losing. You recognize the pattern, trying to somehow reconnect to this that is known without definition. This that the greatest teachings, greatest teachers, greatest events in your life have revealed for an instant getting. Losing, getting, losing. Until a certain ripeness, a certain maturity appears in the, the mind of the seeker. It's at that point that we meet. If you are a truly as immature as you think you are, <laughs> Or as you act. <laughs> you would not be attracted to this, this message from my teacher. You couldn't be, because there's nothing offered here. And you would be going somewhere where there was some power offered or some possibility of keeping or finding or returning or getting or holding. And you know this because you've done that. I remember when I first read Ramana's words years ago in the early 70s, and I said, well, I could feel its truth, but I said, it's too simple. 
it's, it, it's, it doesn't really have anything to do with me. <laughs> and so, you know, for the next 25 years, <laughs> I put my faith in me. <laughs> until there was a disillusionment. Not a disillusionment with the original intention. That can happen. It's a kind of cynicism overlay that can appear. Oh, I lost it. Oh, it didn't work. Oh, the power faded. And a, a level of cynicism as protection for the innocence of the intention. But you are lucky in that you have not been able to Synthesize the original intention to be free, to know the truth. That is still purely awake in you. And you are lucky in that you have been disillusioned in the powers of mind, in its beauty, in the capacity of creation of the mind, which is quite beautiful as well as horrible and nothing wrong with it but an essential disillusionment must appear to really receive what's being offered here to really be able to hear what it means to stop to be still So what I say tonight, I will definitely have said before. But if you hear it tonight, you will hear it for the first time again. There is no history and there is no stopping point to the truth of who one is. So when I say stop, I am not speaking to the truth of who you are. I'm speaking to the activity of mind. And there is a stopping point to that. That stopping point actually occurs many times in a day, but it goes overlooked in our conditioned reflex to pay attention to thought and then thought and then thought, and overlooking what remains unthought, the depth, the truth of oneself. So, once again, or for the first time, I bring to you the invitation that my teacher offered to me and then sent me to offer to you, as he sent others. And that is, in this moment, to stop your search for whatever it is you think will get you whatever it is you think you want. <laughs> yes, that's the result. And it is utterly simple. The complications arise in our resistance to that stopping. The complications are in our hopes that if we just do a little more, we will get whatever it is, spiritual or worldly. But it all boils down to happiness, peace, love. happiness and peace and love, as you have been told by many people, is your nature. But it is not the nature of the mind. The nature of the mind is acquisition and rejection. Perfectly. There's nothing wrong with the nature of the mind. It has a purpose. It's a very good 
to know how to acquire and to reject. It's very useful in certain realms, realms of survival, realms of social interaction, realms of procreation. But in the realmness, bottomless, edgeless, fathomless, eternal truth of who you are, acquiring and rejecting is an obstruction. So you are in this room tonight. You are greatly privileged that your life is not immediately threatened by either starvation or tyranny or someone else's rage. That could change in a week or a decade. But in this room tonight, that's the truth. And so that privilege can be met in the willingness to see the impulse of the mind to reach for or to reject and to stop, to stop the reaching and to stop the rejecting. Just in this moment, so that what has been and will be forever unthought can be realized to be the truth of who you are. experience mm -hmm. where when I'm sitting in silence um, I feel like I'm being there's, there's an energy that comes over me and uh, and, and then fear comes up uh -huh. and it, I kind of go whoa like that and and so it it, it just kind of goes away but I was just wondering if that was like a normal Normal, where we could, you know, we could take a head count or a hand count, and I would say, would bet that those who have had their experience would say, no, it's not normal, it's not good, and those who have not had the experience would say, it's normal, it's good, I want it. It's like that. Yeah, I know. So what if there's no normal experience? And what if? Any experience you have ever had really finally means nothing. That's the truth. I know you want to give up the bad ones and you want to get more of the good ones. I understand that tendency. <laughs> but just for purposes of investigation, what if none of them finally mean anything? Finally. I understand that they mean something along the way. Hmm. That'll be okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Then the point is to be finally here, right. just finally here right now, where nothing that has gone before is left, or even any tracks of anything that has gone before, just to finally be here, where you've always been. Yeah, it's, it's just freedom. Just freedom, that's yeah. right, just freedom. <laughs> oh, just freedom. <laughs> just freedom. <laughs> I didn't mean just freedom. I meant just freedom. <laughs> just freedom. That's all. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's that's the truth. That's the truth. So the conditioning that I keep speaking about is the the belief or the hope or the fear that a certain experience either means you're getting more freedom or a certain experience means you're losing what freedom you've gotten, right? So this is the giving your freedom to experience, and that has been learned. 
that did not come naturally. That has been learned from imitation. So whatever your family thought was a threat, now it gets perceived as a threat, whether it, you know, it was way back in your family tree or it's your immediate family or other lifetimes, however you imagine that in your mind. And then there are experiences that your family approves, whether it's your culture or your subculture or your immediate family or your karmic family, and so those are good. And you want more of those. And then the grasping begins. How do I get more of those? What do I have to do? How to? There is the question again. How to? And that question, how to, is now based on a memory. I'm not saying this is true in your case, but this has gotten me rolling. This memory of a past experience that was perceived as giving you freedom or a past experience that was perceived as possibly taking your freedom away. And that's all about the physical body, the mental body, or the emotional body. It has nothing to do with who you are. No experience touches the awareness of that experience. There are moments where awareness is aware of itself. And there's an experience that often follows that, an experiential byproduct of bliss, self-recognition, relaxation, sublime peace, clarity of seeing, wisdom. If the mental fixation latches on to the experience, then this is the same old grasping. Always awareness is present. Always. And it is free of any experience, however sublime or however horrible. We are so conditioned to want to have no more horrible experiences and a lot more sublime experiences. To have more pleasure, less or no pain. That's, that's part of the physical, emotional, mental conditioning of being a human being. The conditioning itself is not at fault. That's just part, it's hardwired in there. But deeper than that conditioning, closer than that conditioning, is the awareness that is untouched by any event of pleasure or pain that is just free, just free. So experiences will come. Different nervous systems generate different experiences. Sensitive nervous systems have a particular type of experiences. Less sensitive have a particular type, and then all in between. So what? That has nothing to do with who you are. In a moment, this moment, if you stop reaching for any particular experience, or you stop pushing away any particular experience, then you are who you are. There's physical tension, there's physical relaxation, there's emotional tension, emotional relaxation, mental tension, mental, mental relaxation. It's secondary. Pleasurable, painful, secondary. Pleasure feels pleasurable. Pain feels painful. That's still so. But secondary to the truth of who you are. Is this getting through? It's so simple, you know. That's the challenge of speaking it. It's so simple. But what gets heard then is complicated by, yes, but how do I do that? Right? Right? How do I do that? You've written me so many letters telling me, yes, how do I do that? <laughs> That's why I don't answer them. <laughs> So the fire is in not knowing how, no how possible, giving up the possibility to imitate. 
giving up the possibility to grasp or reject, giving up the powers of the mind. For one instant at least, so you can discover directly what the surrender of the powers of the mind can reveal. Just freedom. Just freedom. Thank you. <laughs> You're precious. <laughs> precious. You are too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's a way of saying namaste, isn't it? The question I hear the most is, how, how? <laughs> I know here, but how when I'm there? <laughs> it's really very simple. <clears throat> and often the question how is so complicated that the simplicity is overlooked. Stop. Tell the truth. Be still. So there's a moment where there's an awareness of the suffering or the mind spin or the grasping or the rejecting. Stop. Tell the truth. Even if the truth is, I don't know the truth. I can't do this. I want out of here. I'm miserable. I'll never make it. Whatever it is, tell the truth. Be still. Under the relative truth, feeding the relative truth, is some emotion, some feeling having to do with reaching for or rejecting. If it's positive, it's usually reaching for it. If it's negative, it's usually rejecting it. Stop. Tell the truth. Be still. And then that can be experienced. Under every relative truth, there is a deeper truth, unknown to the mind, but revealed in the willingness to investigate. And there is no end to the depth of truth, until finally there is no one stopping, no one telling the truth, no one being still. Just truth, recognizing itself as the indefinable totality of being. Indefinable. When the mind begins to define, stop. Tell the truth. Be still. <laughs> 